if you want to be up there and be one of the best, and that's the drive, it's, it's a 20 hour a day pursuit. It gets to the stage where the person who's the best at doing it is the person who's the most obsessed. It drives you to do mad things. This is the voice of a criminal hacker who goes by the online handle Phobos. He refuses to appear on camera. If you're actually at the sharp end, the realisation you come to is that I'm going to try and break into the best computers I can possibly break into before they arrest me. So let's not get caught for breaking into our local library. <laughs> yeah. That would be stupid. Let's get caught for breaking into a bank. Because then we might get a book deal. <laughs> in the brave new dawn of e-commerce, in the internet wonderland, the geeks have inherited the earth. Hackers wield enormous power. They move in mysterious ways on networks now central to our daily lives. Elusive and suspicious, few have spoken out until now. It's the best game in the world. It's better than sex. The entire internet is built on systems put up by people who are ignorant, uninformed and arrogant. I think you have to look at the hackers that's basically a force of nature. You're not going to round them all up, you're not going to arrest them, you're not going to stop them. Never before have so many people had power in their own hands. Are they ignored visionaries? Political scapegoats? In this program, hackers speak for themselves and reveal what drives them and their world. Today's computer-driven world was pioneered by techno-geeks. Their vision of the internet was a utopian space of free-flowing code and ideas. The last thing they expected was the virtual reality shopping mall that cyberspace has become. Some hackers defy the system. They call themselves Black Hats. They're 21st century cowboys who will break the law to roam freely on the range of cyberspace. This man was once considered one of the most dangerous criminal hackers in Britain. Not wanting to reveal his home address, he met us at the local laundrette. How do you do? I am glad you are here early. This is my uncle. He is working at home today. His work is very Twenty-four years old and arrested for computer crime twice, charged with breaking into over 100 mainframes, 50 universities, government and military departments, British Telecom and NASA. His online handle is Coldfire. From his university digs in Manchester, the teenage Coldfire hacked into every web server that existed. Break over the phone network out of the UK. Like, if the president of America wanted to call the prime minister, he wouldn't have been able to. If you just get a massive adrenaline rush and you think, yes, I'm the greatest. Yeah. Within, um, from starting to attack somewhere, we'd usually get in within an hour, two hours, three hours. It's like the world's biggest crossword puzzle. But the clues keep changing, the answers keep changing. You've got to keep doing it. It's the intellectual challenge. It is an obsession, it's an addiction. Once you're doing it, you've got to keep on going. You've got to get more sites into more places, do better places, do cooler places. And that's what drives you. That's why you get up at, like, have five hours sleep during the day and then get up and hack again, straight back on the computer. Phobos has been active for almost 20 years. He's an Uber hacker who designs new ways to crack into government and commercial computer networks. He's never been caught. This is not the back of Phobos's head. You might get up in the morning and um, you set a program going that's dialing a lot of numbers. 
you look at all the computers that you managed to snarf. Perhaps a retail outlet, perhaps a bank. You know, see if you've got anywhere good. You might spend a couple of hours trying to get into those. The meat and vegetables of your day, like that, is going to be going around, I don't know, 20 educational sites in America and Britain and stuff, reading the email that you managed to steal, reading the police's email. Yeah. I need to make sure I don't get caught. The evening is probably going to be spent going for the one site that is your project for the week or the fortnight, which might be a bank, it might be um, an ISP, it might be wherever. And then you go and get your four hours sleep, and then you get up the next day and do the same thing again. <laughs> and again and again and again. And then you get good. <laughs> and then you get into places. And then that suggests more places. <laughs> and then you get into them. And then it just goes mental at that stage. While black hat hackers are obsessives, hammering at networks 20 hours a day, their opponents, the sysadmins, who work for the networks, are more nine to five. Much of the internet is easy meat for the dedicated black hat. In the black hat's world, websites can be altered. The Spice Girls can be shaved bald. The Pope can lose his trousers. In the black hat's world, your plain text email is public property. Cyber junkie. He's been arrested and released for hacking. I think one of the things that kind of leads to the obsession of control in, in the internet is a, a lack of control in your own life. You want to exert your force some way. A lot of hackers do in many ways kind of resemble the uh, I've been bullied so I'm going to bully kind of uh, scenario. A challenge for the junkie. In front of him is a simulation of an internet service provider similar to Demon, Clarinet, or British Telecom. Cyber Junkie will attempt to break in and access a personal email account under the name of Anne. It'll probably take me about two minutes. got full access to the machine now. I'm running as user ID root, which is the super user, which gives me complete access to the entire system. And I've got uh, the mailbox for a user called Anne open, and I've collected uh, a credit card number from it. Despite the vulnerability of the internet, which wasn't designed for confidential transactions, the movement for e-commerce and online banks has ploughed ahead. In August last year, police intervened when the internet bank Egg was reported to have lost thousands of pounds from online accounts. Phobos believes the cracking of Egg was just the beginning. I was amazed the first time I saw online banking. I've been breaking into computers for 20 years. I couldn't believe it when, when my friend logged in on the web and went, OK, I'm in here, here's my bank statement or whatever. And I was like, so, can you transfer money from that? And he's like, yes. And I'm like, what, to any account? Or do you have to, like, confirm it in writing or anything? And he was like, no, not at all. You just enter the account and you transfer the money. And I'm going, well, this is just ridiculously insecure. Phobos thinks some hackers have already devised a simple way to siphon funds from our bank accounts. Rather than choosing, for example, your account number and then trying to guess your PIN and repeatedly trying and trying and trying, what they're doing is they're getting a PIN, let's guess 1234, and they're trying 1234 as the PIN for lots and lots of different account numbers. And because online banking is becoming so widespread that you can guess that across a lot of different banks as well, and I tell you what, you're going to get hit eventually. I, I predict some serious bank hacks in the next 12 months. The easiest way into a computer network is by the front door. Guess the password. A favourite hacker game. Someone in an office is asked to choose a password. They go look around them. They might see a monitor, potted plant, something like that. Or they'll use 
some combination of their name, maybe their initials, date of birth, their uh, daughter's name, mother's name, something like that. Um, but it's basically intuition. You can like feel basically like what passwords to try and most of the time you'll gain. People don't choose you difficult passwords because otherwise if they did, they can't remember. The holy grail for a hacker is to find the password of a root system. Root is the master key controlling an entire computer network. But even some root passwords can be guessed easily. One time I found a dial-up for a system and it belonged to a major high street bank. And there's a uh, account on Unix systems called root which basically controls everything. And the root password on this system was control. User ID root, password control. That's it, you're in, you've got control. It was that simple. Meanwhile, Cyber Junkie still has work to do. In his second attack, he must penetrate a simulated web server and deface a website. This is what the Pope and the Spy Skills have suffered. Once you're in a web server, a lot of hackers tend to find web pages, especially high profile ones, and change them to display their own message. This is what we're going to do. Okay. I've just modified briefly, just putting the words hacked into the websites. If a machine is vulnerable, it's that easy. That's how fast it takes you to break into it and set it up so you can gain access. Craving notoriety, Black Hats post a copy of their defaced website, like a cyber trophy, to attrition.org, a hacker's hall of fame which monitors attacks worldwide. Now he's accessed the target system. Cyber Junkie uses a favorite hacker tool, a Trojan. It's a concealed program which makes him an invisible extra user on the system, so he can come and go at any time in the future. Beware of geeks bearing gifts. Trojaning comes around from uh, the Trojan horse, from Homer's Iliad. Same kind of principle. We're concealing our code within someone else's code, tucking it away neatly so that generally you wouldn't see it's there. Then you sort of ease your way gently into the network. Once you've got maybe one or two hosts, you start observing. Just watch the traffic, see what people are doing, what times people log on, what times people log off. When it's safe to start expanding your uh, control of their network and just gradually move yourself into machine after machine until you find your target. Maybe a bit of access, maybe copy some emails, maybe kick a user off, maybe even shut down the machine. We have even more access than the uh, network administrator himself has because the network administrator has to account for everything that he does. We don't have to account for anything because we're not there. We're ghosts in the machine. If ghosts in the machine are a reality, how best to deal with them? In the past, government and corporations turned to the law to make an example of known hackers. Um, I was sitting there in my front room with a couple of mates, can of beer in one hand, and uh, suddenly the doors to the lounge burst open. All these men for the lion, I'm grabbed out of my seat, pushed down on the floor, arms behind my back, and there's this copper, both my arms behind my back, twisting my arms, going, move, I'm going to break your arms. Or was that effect. Then I was transferred from Manchester down to London in a prison van. They like, had the radio on, gave me all the papers to read, and I had quite a good time. They were playing uh, Born Slippy on the radio. Uh, which we'd always like listen to when we were hacking and stuff. And um, I was just thinking, well, at least I've done it. I had a good time. I don't regret a minute of it. Coldfire was convicted on a lesser charge of phone fraud, but computer misuse acts in Britain and the United States are tough, stipulating up to five years prison for persistent unauthorized access on a computer network. But prosecutions have been few and far between. Technical and extremely difficult to prove, they've rarely been successful. So if you can't beat them, maybe you join them. Former CIA spy Robert Steele 
holds the unconventional view that hackers are not the cause of the problem, but merely the symptom. The people who caused the damage were the moronic assholes in the first place that built the system that is so vulnerable that a kid in a bedroom can cause it to hiccup. Now, if you don't want moronic assholes, I'll rephrase that. We could wipe out cybercrime tomorrow simply by legislating due diligence standards for corporations. We are allowing the Bill Gateses of the world. We are allowing the internet equipment manufacturers, the computer manufacturers, to sell equipment that is not good enough. Companies are stealing us blind by not protecting their formulas, by not protecting their intellectual property, by not protecting your bank account, by not protecting you from identity theft. Steele used to recruit hackers for Marine Corps intelligence. Gradually, corporations are joining in, tempting hackers away from the dark side with big bucks to become white hats. Hackers who use their outlaw skills to good ends as IT consultants hacking to test security systems. In the United States, hacker culture is going mainstream. Most hackers today are either getting wealthy or have every opportunity to get wealthy. We should follow them, not shoot them. Today, getting access to a computer is easy. But that wasn't the case in the 1960s, when the first hackers took a swig of coffee and logged on. The original hackers were pimply computer science students at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Paul Taylor of Salford University has been writing about these hackers for almost 10 years. The power contained in a modern personal computer in the early days had to be housed in a huge big laboratory, you know, the size of this room. Access was very limited to these computers and they wanted access, so they were called mainframe hackers. Then, as computers became more and more well-networked across the world and with the personal computer revolution, the hacking community grew from outside MIT. And from the late 80s onwards, increasingly, there's been a large social movement or a large social process whereby the establishment figures have sought to demonize hackers and make them into the big baddies. And I think it's occurred simultaneously with the realization that our computer systems are incredibly vulnerable. Who better to fix that vulnerability than the people who exposed it in the first place? While some hackers put on a black hat and raged against the establishment, others have chosen to help companies in cyberspace and become white hat hackers. Hackers are moving into an era when what they know is priceless. In times of consequential change, it's the mutants that save the world. I'm serious here. There's a very serious point. When you come to a revolutionary change in your circumstances, all of the good little boys and girls that kept their toenails clipped and, and, and didn't get dirt on their shirts and said, yes, mommy, and no, mommy, and all of that stuff, they stand around in a panic not knowing what to do. And it's the mutants, the ones that went out and pulled legs off frogs and explored and, and got dirty that actually end up being able to save the world. We have a very volatile society right now. We are extraordinarily dependent on computers. So all of these people that have dared to think for themselves are now emerging as a new elite. Mutants of all shades come together each year to talk main boards, firewalls, and favorite episodes of South Park. It's called the DEF CON convention. Hacking used to make you an outlaw. Now, it's a career choice. When DEF CON first started seven years ago, it was spoken about in hushed tones in the hacker underworld. But today, it's a full-blown corporate convention. In Las Vegas, of course. Amidst the t-shirts, paunches and ponytails, hackers are eagerly approached by startup companies, hoping to employ them to improve online security. Even young hackers expelled from school 
now plan careers in the computer industry. John Canty and Jason Friel are dreaming of the big time in Salem, New Hampshire. You're 17, 18, 19, and you're in school, you know, and uh, sh hits the fan. I did get caught doing a few things that were just kind of dumb and stupid, but not really destructive or anything. So, uh, you know, after that, they just kind of, anything that went wrong, they kind of blamed it on me. And me and my friend did, uh, we were being kind of weird on, the, on their network, we kept trying to, like, actually get into each other's accounts without a password, which was, you know, interesting, you know. Under my account, they had found, you know, just, tons of utilities and things basically designed to get around the security and Novell network. And uh, you know, it was at that point that they basically said, all right, you're suspended for 10 days, don't come after school at all because you know, you'll be suspended for another 10 days and uh, don't ever touch a computer for the next two years of your high school. This is the uh, the den, <laughs> um, our fridge. Have a beer. Uh, above and beyond that, this is where uh, the house of uh, EvilComputing.net is. John and his friends Jason and Greg set up their group Evil Computing Net a few years ago. Their hacking skills may not have been appreciated at school, but now they can hack for profit, helping local companies test online security loopholes. Hooked on hacking, they stay up till the early hours, sniffing out networks. There are various theories as to why hackers hack, and some of the more interesting and often humorous theories revolve around Freudian interpretations of Oedipal scenarios. So there's this notion of climbing back into the womb, and people want to engage with the system. There are also psychosexual theories whereby hackers want to penetrate systems, and it would perhaps partially explain why there are incredibly few female hackers. Maybe they don't have the same almost hardwired desire to penetrate systems like these adolescent, scarcely post-pubescent male hackers do. There is an obsessive element, and I would suggest it's part of computing in general. You have to be very precise and put a lot of effort in, be very particular, very pedantic, and that encourages obsessive mental traits, I would suggest. There is some serious holes in it. Hey, I think you'll appreciate this one, Canty. Yeah, also, there, there is something very seductive about a computer screen, as with a TV screen. People browse the web, they'll spend three or four hours searching for something that's not that important. And when they eventually find it, it's like this massive, they've got the holy grail. And if you actually objectively analyse what they've done, they've been in almost like a trance four hours and achieved very little. But you almost lose track of time. Now, if that can happen over something as banal and, you know, low-key as web browsing, when you think you're trying to get into the Pentagon, it's quite obvious that, you know, eight hours later, you may not have realised even where you've been. You don't really notice the time, I mean, but you just want to get it done, get it out of the way, and move on to the next thing. So yeah. you just keep going at it, and I'm like, oh, I spent six hours in front of my computer. <laughs> so. You think more of the end result than what you're currently doing. I had one emotional uh, piece of correspondence with a hacker that said if he was deprived access to his computers, it would like be being left alone in the desert without water. His body needed physical contact with computers. So hackers themselves often do exhibit addictive, obsessive qualities. Um, no. uh, 
if I don't understand something and I'm going at it, uh, I definitely go for brute force method. Um, just go at it until you can figure it out. Yeah. Um, do everything wrong, right, and different until... His handle is Tommy Pickles. Now in his late 20s, he's been obsessed by computers since the age of eight. Convicted in 1996 of computer crime, he now works for a broadband media company. This is comfortable. As their head of security. This is comfortable. I'm not proud of anything, really. Um, I, I've had a lot of troubles in the past. Um, there was this one instance where I did get arrested and I got convicted of a crime. And I've been, you know, shadowing that for some time. There's different types of hackers. Um, there's the white hat and there's the black hat. White hat hackers are the hackers who do things for a purpose, kind of the save the world type of hackers, secure this manhole so no one falls into it type of thing. Yo. A lot of the black hat people won't talk about it because black hat people are genuinely evil people and they will hack websites just to do it and put their name up there and go, ha ha, I've hacked you. I consider myself gray hat. Sometimes I'd like to pull the occasional prank. I'd like to shut down someone else's website. I'd like to play with their stuff, maybe pop up a dialogue box and say, you've been hacked. but. Then I'll tell them why I did it, or I might explain to them if I like the person. You realize I can't view porn here at work, right? <laughs> if I don't like the person, they should just brush up. You don't get on a bicycle unless you know how to really ride it. In the States, it's chic to be geek. Tommy has formed a tightly knit hacker group around him. They call themselves Moloch, have their own website, t-shirts, and gothy attitude with slogans like, we stay crispy in milk. Every Friday after work, the group meets in Brooklyn to indulge in the geek diet of junk food and soda. Hello, it's Tommy. How much? We're in the van. We're not taking the transit over because it's raining out. To have a group around you, it kind of makes you feel safe that somebody believes in the same ideals that you might be believing at, at the time. We were just we were discussing the name for a while, uh, what we should call our little collective. Um, I really had a fascination with the name uh, uh, Medulla Oblongata, which is the brainstem. <laughs> but everyone said, "How is anyone going to find the web page? No one knows how to spell Medulla Oblongata." Uh, so we kicked around a couple of ideas, and we were watching the movie Metropolis, and. The god in the movie Metropolis is named Moloch. Wow. Wow. Welcome to the new establishment. They hold down well-paid jobs in computer security. But the Moloch Collective can't shake off that schoolyard feeling of being outsiders. We call ourselves geeks. We like the word. Geeks are like nerds with social skills, I think. It's the best way to describe us. I mean, we've taken the word back. We're proud to be geeks now. I don't think any of us were really ever on the inside of anything. I think that's why it's so great now we found each other and we're finally in something. I mean, we all grew up being on the outside of social groups, on the yeah, outside of school. Either. We just got a lot of abuse from our peers. You know, we had, I don't think any of us had a lot of dates in high school. Teachers don't like you either because you're just, you know, being a kid that smart is creepy to them. Or you ask why and they don't know why. Yes, why too A often. lot of adults get very freaked out when you say, but why, but why, and you want an interesting answer, not because I said, you want an interesting answer, not because I said so. 
many interesting subjects. They just suck dry. They were like intellectual vampires. And I just, you know, I started cutting classes a lot. I mean, I was, the scary part was I was still, for the most part, passing. Let's face it, we make so much more money than the people who used to pick on us in high school. It's not even funny. I mean, they're all losers. Don't you dream of bringing your car back and to the repair shop where they're working? They didn't get the right skills in high school. They were too busy, you know, being on the, going to pep rallies and shit. And now, they're nobodies. I mean, they work in gas stations and stuff. Yeah, you lucky one. I'm they may earn more than their bitter enemies from school, but this is a nouveau elite, only recently respectable. The geek class is insecure. It shouts to make itself heard by big business. They don't want to listen to a bunch of geeks and weirdos, and the entire internet is built on systems that are put up by people who are ignorant, uninformed, and arrogant. And, you know, it wouldn't take much to take it all down really quickly, and that's a scary thought. They're at a point where they really want to blame any internet problems on hackers. Some hacker kid will uh, find a vulnerability in a corporation and send email to the systems administrator saying, hey, I just want to let you know there's this vulnerability, you should fix it. And over and over again, this is like a, a stereotype almost, it's a cliche, the systems administrator will send email back saying, we're coming after you, you son of a bitch, you know, <laughs> how dare you probe our network, you know, and it's, it's, it's that same corporate mentality of injured pride. Hackers have money, but they have yet to develop influence in the political landscape. At their Las Vegas conference, hackers exercise their right to bear arms. On the internet as well, Many are shooting back, using their hacking skills to make the world see cyberspace their way. There is an alternative moral universe on the web. The hacker underground has its own moral code, and it has enormous power to make big business and government listen to its point of view. Hackers don't wave placards on the street. They can protest from home deface a website with electronic graffiti, or crash a web server. From his base in Manhattan, Ricardo Dominguez has coordinated crippling attacks on the White House web server and sites such as the Pentagon, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, and the Mexican government. He uses the internet to protest against the military suppression of the native population in the Chiapas region of Mexico. The Mexican Revolution. Taking the side of the Zapatista movement, which campaigns for greater autonomy in Chiapas, his group, the Electronic Disturbance Theatre, has waged war online. He calls it Digital Zapatismo. What we wanted to do is create a process by which a large community could gather together and a sit down following the traditions of Thoreau, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, ACT UP, and, and just create a symbolic disturbance based on the weight of that community. Que vale. Que viva Chiapas. Que viva Mexico. Que viva Zapata. There are times when the human community in the flesh has to stand on the superhighway for a brief period of time, like any uh, civil disobedience, and say, Ya basta, enough is enough. Ya basta. But how do you hold a sit-in on the web? Dominguez turned to Carmen Karasic, a former hacker and programmer. Karasic helped write Floodnet, the software that has become the main weapon of the electronic disturbance theatre. Floodnet automated the process of striking the reload key on a website. People on their home PCs could download a website automatically every seven seconds. With sufficient users online working together, this would soon overload a target website. Floodnet is a Java applet which reloads the refresh button over and over on the, based on the number of people who participate on the action. It's like a little wheel which is the applet, and it hits the button over and over and goes 
Can I have information? Website goes yes. Okay, here you go. Hello, can I have information? Yes, here you go. Hello, can I have information? 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 Can I have information? Can I have more, more, more? And then finally the server says, I can't give out any more information right now. I think if you're going to make some sort of political statement in cyberspace, it should be a collective statement. It should be a statement that is not just my opinion, but a statement that's multiple thousands of people's opinion. In 1998, targeting the website of the President of Mexico to protest about Chiapas, Dominguez organized a mass online sit-in through Floodnet. We started the action, it was a four-hour action, and during those four hours, some 38,000 people around the world joined, and many people around the world got the message from President Cedillo's website saying, at this moment, too many requests are taking place, please come back later. With the cyber squatting of Floodnet, Electronic Disturbance Theater has pioneered a whole new arena of protest, online electronic civil disobedience, a mix of hacking and activism known as Hacktivism. One of the things that um, cyberspace does is it brings individual power to anyone who cares to learn the technology. If you want to do it, you can do it. And that's the sort of leveling of the playing field that I'm sure really scares the hell out of governments. Because we basically put the tools in these individuals' hands to do whatever they want with them, and we're able to mobilize people at a global level at a moment's notice. 1998 was the dawn of cyber war. In April, the Electronic Disturbance Theater launched a 24-hour attack on the Pentagon to continue its protest against the Mexican government. To their surprise, the Pentagon took the attack so seriously, it decided to strike back at the hackers by launching a hostile program at each of its tormentors to crash Floodnet. This was the first act of offensive information war that had ever occurred that we know of publicly. Uh, the Pentagon broke a law called the Posse Comitatus Law, which means that the government uh, cannot use the Navy, the Army, uh, or any um, intelligence against the civilian population in the United States. And they were attacking civilian servers here in New York City. It also was overkill by far. For, for what we were doing. Of course they're scared. They're not in control anymore. The Electronic Disturbance Theater's methods have been adopted by other groups. In the battle in Seattle in 1999, the protesters against the World Trade Organization Conference not only coordinated their street demonstrations via the internet, they attacked the WTO web server. A more human face needs to be put on the global This is what happens to the corporate democracy. In New York, William Taylor, who goes by the handle Reverend Billy, wages online war against the global ambitions of Disney and the Starbucks coffee company. When not disrupting service in Starbucks, he urges hackers to stage an online sit-in. Unfortunately, he's never mustered enough support to be effective, presumably because coffee is the hacker's drink of choice. In 1999, as e-commerce exploded on the net, the tactics of cyber war and virtual protests were turned against the commercial world. Online sit-ins and website defacements have become a daily occurrence. Anita Ramasastri of Washington has been monitoring new ways in which hackers are railing against what they consider the strip mauling of their web. There is a struggle for the heart of cyberspace going on now, and hackers are part of it. One has to remember that the internet, when it started, was a, a widely open architecture that was really unregulated. Perhaps the Wild West, but one would say to, that the freedom really created um, innovation, freedom, the idea of open code or programs that everybody had access to. And now you have increasing numbers of corporations who not only have used the internet, but are copywriting and patenting everything that's there, from the, the material that's published to the technology and the programs that one uses to access the information. And so you're seeing a back 
backlash against them. Really, they're fighting for the soul of the internet. Uh, should the internet be owned by corporations where you almost have to pay a toll to get onto the information superhighway? Or is the internet free? Is it a public library where everyone can check out a book and, to, and, and have free access? And I think hackers would say it should be free. Hackers have defaced commercial sites like Kriegsman Furs and the American domestic airline ValueJet. The Pope's Christmas message has also provoked attack. The news is the Vatican has just hired a hacker to prevent further embarrassing security breaches. Even God hires hackers. Some of uh, the hacktivism that you see is really about not just any corporation, but about companies who violate or sort of breach certain codes of the internet, or netiquette, as some people say. The Electronic Disturbance Theatre stepped into the debate about internet freedom in one celebrated domain dispute. eToys.com with an S aggressively attacked eToy.com, a net art group from Sweden that had existed since 94. But of course, 99 was the year of e-commerce. And this Goliath emerged saying that eToy.com without an S was disturbing millions and millions of dollars worth of value because people accidentally forgot to put an S. And they shut down the group using a U.S. court. But what eToys.com didn't realize was that there was already an electronic civil disobedience movement. And we started a 12 days of Christmas action against eToys where we declared we would do a virtual sit-in that would bring eToy stock down to zero. And by January 15th, eToys.com had relented, had given back eToy, the art group, their name, their domain, would pay for all the court costs and promise never to bother another net art group. Back in Britain, Hacktivism has infiltrated party politics, with persistent rumours about hackers leaking sensitive government documents and graffiti on both Labour and Conservative websites. The Labour Party, they replaced the image of uh, Tony Blair with a spitting image puppet, um, and basically implied that uh, the entire Labour Party were a bunch of Muppets, um, and the Conservative Party, they stuck up a swastika behind uh, John Major's head. Cyber Junkie has learnt about it at the sharp end. He's been questioned by police about breaking into the Labour Party's computers. And released without charge, of course. As hackers, we are control freaks. And we like to control things. We, we love to control the internet and we love to control computers. Well, hacktivism or political hacking is merely an extension of that. It's reaching out and starting to control the world around you. I think the best kind of hacktivism attack would be something done subtly, where you penetrate a site and you make some modifications to information. For example, a manifesto on a political site. You do it in such a way that it's not glaringly obvious. The only changes are actually to the content. And then you leave it. And you let that piece of information spread itself about. Chances are it won't be found for a long time. But there are cynics in cyberspace. Not all hackers believe in hacktivism. For Phobos, hacking is a crime, and hacktivism simply a way of justifying a crime. What they're trying to do is they've discovered the same truth that I've discovered and that everyone else I know has discovered, which is that breaking into other people's computers is a whole lot of fun. Yeah. But they're not sufficiently smart enough or morally bankrupt enough to just go, OK, that's it, and that's why I'm doing it. So they're trying to justify to themselves why they're doing it. So they will discover a course. They'll go, I break into the computers because um, I don't like paedophiles, and therefore I'm going to go after paedophiles. Or I break into computers because I'm helping them secure their systems because I'm pointing out the vulnerabilities. I think that's nonsense. Yeah. At the end of the day, what they're doing is exactly what I'm doing, or used to do, and um, exactly what a whole lot of other people are doing, which is, I like breaking into computers because breaking into computers is fun, it gives me a rush, it's a power trip, and that's what it's all about. I think it's about getting what you want to get, doing what you want to do, and then vanishing again and not getting caught. Some do it for a weekly wage. 
some do it for a cause. But the common thread that links all hacking is the electric thrill the first computer science students felt when they broke into early mainframes. The thrill of unauthorized access, exploring secret data and pitting your wits against the system. For Coldfire, a black hat hacker who did get caught, hacking serves no other purpose than selfish pleasure. No excuses. I wasn't doing it for like any kind of course. I did it because it was fun, it made me feel good, it gave me an adrenaline rush, I enjoyed it. It's about abuse of trust, really. People do not expect someone to come wandering along and uh, break into their computer. Hackers are antisocial people. They invade people's personal and business space. Um, you can't really support that. But it's, it's not right to hack at the end of the day. We do it because it's good fun, but it's not right.